What, what is that? Is that a bomb? What is that? It's beeping. Put it down, Bucky. It's beeping. That was a Kamoyo bead. That's another Kamoyo bead. White Wolf still at it. Someone's leaving breadcrumbs for you, dude. And then they I was appear. wondering when you were going to show up. That oh, shit! That's AO. Wakanda. We got Wakanda. Wakanda. Welcome back to New Rockstars, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Episode 3, episode titled Power Broker. Teams up, Sam and Bucky with Dance Off to Save the Universe contender Baron Zemo <laughs> and Sharon <laughs> Carter <laughs> hopping from Germany to Magiport to the Baltic with a dash of Wakanda in mm -hmm. there. Yep, uh, this Dormelage cameo is actually way bigger than just mere vengeance for T'Chaka. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. <laughs> and Sharon Carter, what's going on with her? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's... Uh, a question for Inside Marvel, New Rock Stars After Show for the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I'm Eric Voss here with MT. What's going How you on? How doing after this episode, MT? Oh man, this episode was pretty good. I was I've been missing Sharon Carter for so long, so it's so uh -huh. great to see her kick ass. Like she really messed up some dudes, and I'm, she I'm did. all here for it. <laughs> the this episode felt like a, a John Wick kind of fever oh. dream in a way. Going to Madge Report with you know those bounty alerts on their phones. Sharon Carter throwing knives through people's arms. Mm -hmm. It felt like uh, they took characters that we knew from Civil War and then just said, ah, what if they were this instead? Right? right, what if they were John Wick flavored? Let's let's find out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun action. Um, some very confusing characterization at times yeah. that we have questions about. Apparently German prisons have never had a prison riot before because <laughs> it was way too easy for a supervillain to escape that prison. I uh, I mean, maybe they were just well-behaved prisoners up until that point, and then they're just like, oh, we've never had a riot before. How do we handle this? Security? On chest day? <laughs> we're really having a fight on chest day, guys? I thought we had a deal. <laughs> uh, well, okay. In this after show, we're going to answer your biggest WTFs, which yes. to us, of course, stands for... What, what the, the Falcon? Falcon? <laughs> so in this episode, episode three, Bucky helps Zemo break out of this prison. At first, it seems hypothetically, but just kidding. It's uh, uh, pathetically, which Very I guess means far too easily and way too fast. <laughs> really just writer saying, we just need him out of prison, okay? Don't question it. Yeah. And then apparently this whole gritty Sokovian militant version of Zemo that we saw in Civil War also had a ton of f you money. He was a baron. He was part a of rich royalty. man. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, bunch of cars. He loves classic cars. The chemistry among this trio was really fun to watch. Uh, yes. They take this private jet to Madripoor, where they team up with Sharon Carter, who is a faithful government agent in Captain America Winter Soldier and Civil War, turned insane John Wick universe character, Yeah, uh, who's now like an <laughs> art uh, dealer. Um... Sure. And they uh, all together track down through a bunch of like uh, deals being made to this guy, Dr. Nagel, mm -hmm. which is an interesting name for the comics. He was part of Project Rebirth, the whole Isaiah Bradley program. Uh, in this show, he's a scientist who bounced from Hydra to the CIA to the power broker and ended up replicating 20 doses of super soldier serum that were since stolen by the Flag Smashers, who I guess plan to give it to kids. Come on, kids. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the last oh. group of people I would give any sort of power to, but hey. Right. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then in the final scene, Bucky uh, follows a trail of Kamoyo beads to mm -hmm. Adora Malage. This is Ao. Wakanda. Yeah. We got some Wakanda representation. We had some nice Wakanda drums there, too. Oh, so man. cool. I missed um, it. I didn't know how much I missed that music until oh, it happened. I, I was like, oh my god, it's been so long since Black Panther. I know. So we're going to talk about this Black Panther crossover. We're going to talk about Zemo. We're going to talk about Sharon Carter and why she's probably not the power broker herself. Yeah. I know some of you are saying she must be the power broker. No, no, no. But she is weird as hell on the show. So we're going to talk about <laughs> why really that's sketchy. the case. Yeah. Oh, and real quick, I am wearing our latest Obsession shirt. This is Anarchy Assembled. You can get these at NewRockStarsMerch.com. If you do, you'll unlock an additional option to write in a custom shout out that will appear at the bottom of these Inside Marvel After Shows. For example, we got Jeff Jackson, the famous Jeff Jackson. Hey, I love that reference. <laughs> I yeah, mean, oh man. Uh, he says, don't trust the therapist. Yeah, um, trust therapists in general. We'd all do better yes, with a please. bit of therapy. Therapy is case, great. If you need therapy, go to therapy. But you know, therapy. I do understand what they're saying with don't trust the therapist. Because like the, the camera angles on episode one were kind of weird. But 
We'll yeah. see. And then Oliver Holmes says, I really hope that Arnim Zola will come into the show. Hey, <laughs> Oliver, you and us right? together on that Welcome Zola Welcome to the Zola car. train. Let's Zola, go. Zola, Zola. We'll punch your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Any way that we could try to work Zola into this, we will. Um, and then uh, Sabrina Baskerville says, Lil Nas X is Mephisto. Uh, yeah, clearly. Clearly. Yeah. He was very uh -huh. clear with that. <laughs> I think, yeah, he, he boldly declared himself as such. I love it. <laughs> Honestly, I would love if Kevin Feige just made him Mephisto. Like, yes. Fuck it, <laughs> oh, he would be perfect for the role. So good. <laughs> All right, MT, what's our first What the Falcon? Well, I'm glad you asked, Eric, because the first What the Falcon of the day is What the Falcon is the Dora Milaje Ao doing here in this program. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this ending scene. Ao, this uh, actress is Florence, Florence Kasumba. She was really second in command of Wakanda's Dora Milaje Royal Guard. She served mm. right underneath Okoye, and she was actually the first member of the Dora Milaje we met appearing in Captain America uh, Civil War, and uh, she was T'Challa's bodyguard. And she later reappeared in uh, Black Panther and Avengers Infinity War. Actually, yeah. we weren't sure if she was still alive because the last time we saw her, she was facing off with Corvus Glaive to protect yes. Shuri as Shuri was racing to detach the Mind Stone from mm -hmm. Vision. So our buddy Vision is getting reconnected with this. I love it. Hey. Um, this episode reminded us, of course, that Zemo was the actual man responsible for King yeah. T'Chaka's death. And the Wakandas are just not going to let that go. So now it seems like AO is just there to bring Zemo to justice. Sure, sure, makes sense. But... Wakanda crossing over into the storyline broadens the map of the series even further. It means Bucky's past as the White Wolf is going to be even more important to this show. Mm. Because at the same time on the show, until you've noticed this, the history of Erskine's super soldier serum is really at the heart of it. Yeah. And in this episode, we talked about its origins with Red Skull and how Erskine was originally working with Red Skull. And then it went to Cap and it bulked him up and then... Hydra tried to recreate it for their Winter Soldier program. Mm. And then we know it went to Isaiah Bradley. Uh, and then Dr. Nagel and the CIA. The CIA is involved in this. And then after the snap happened, he ended up uh, on the other side of that, joining the Power Broker. Mm. And then that's where the Flag Smashers stole it. But throughout all this history, there's always been one missing piece to it. Uh, mm. We're always wondering what made Erskine's serum different when he gave it to Cap versus when he gave it to Red Skull. What was that missing ingredient? Um, that probably barbecue cocktail. sauce, honestly. Pretty uh, much, yeah. Add barbecue <laughs> sauce. Yeah, uh, yeah. A sriracha or a bit of tapatio. Yeah. You're just like, we'll yeah. just throw something in there, some parsley. Just, just, just do some yeah. trial and error. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, well, that's yeah. a very good point. Because like, we just don't know what made um, that Steve Rogers formula so potent, so perfect. So perfect. And I think... <laughs> We might have a big clue here, based on the themes of this series and mm. the show now extending its roots to Wakanda, that Erskine might have derived a component of this serum from the Wakandan heart-shaped herb. Oh. Now, that has been brought up in MCU theories before. I think we've talked about it on this channel uh, plenty of times. But that would be the one missing ingredient, and it would stay true to this whole idea of mm. Captain America's legacy Using a shield made of vibranium, presumably mm. taken from Mount Bashanga or somewhere in Wakanda, all vibranium in the world is like considered to be property of the Wakandan people. Mm. And now in this case, he could be empowered by another resource that you could argue is appropriated, colonized from that soil. So now uh, Ao could be the key to that missing link. Do you think I'm so onto anything here, MT? I really, really like that because... Um... Like, the MCU is a very science-heavy um, and logic-heavy universe. So to have, to bring it back to, like, all right, so Erkzine possibly went to Wakanda or possibly just found this heart-shaped herb and, and used the science behind the herb to develop the formula, I would love that to just wheel around because then it would explain um, Black Panther's um, physiology um, when he had it and also Killmonger when he uh, took the Black Herb as well. So I'm the heart shaper as well. So like, I really, really love that theory. I like. Well, and then Nagel says in this episode, he's like, I refine the process. No more like uh, muscle growth or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's uh, just, um, it's subtle. Yeah. And that's what it is in Black Panther. It's just the purest version of it. It just enhances their agility, their strength, their mm. speed when they take it in. And um, and when Erskine talks about what his cocktail was made of, it he also talked about steroids to stimulate uh, stimulate growth and these mm. vita rays or all these other things on top of it. But like 
basically it's the difference between ecstasy and MDMA, you know? It's, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a purer version. It's not the same thing, <laughs> but it makes you feel the same. Mm, you can just like brule all night with that stuff. <laughs> Dude, I love that they went to the club in this episode. I was just <laughs> dying. It's like, hey, we need some time to kill. Let's take uh, Zemo to the club. Let's just, just and Zemo <laughs> dancing like, just really lame. <laughs> they gave us just enough time to make a gif out of it. Oh thank my. you. Thank you, editor of the show. Thank you so And thank much. you to our editors, by the way. I, I ended up working in a shout out to our editors there because I don't thank them enough. John and oh Josh my God. and our whole they team. They are wonderful. All... Everybody oh, that you. does work on the show, like magicians, all of you. We yeah. love you. Thank our you guys. Whole, yeah, off-screen staff, uh, Brandon, Barrick, and Zach Huddleston. All you guys. Are all of you. We love you. Mwah. Uh, but now that we have AO in the show, I didn't think we would see a Black Panther reference this soon. Mm. MT, do you think we'll get any reference to T'Challa or what his status is at this see, point? See, that's the first thing I thought of when I saw AO. I was like, are we going to get an update? Like, what's going to yeah. go on? Um, I, I hope so. I think that uh, the next episode we're going to find out what exactly or get a hint at um, what's going on with T'Challa. Because I, I honestly do think that Kevin Feige is waiting for um, like a theatrical release where more eyes will be on it to announce, you know, A, what's happening with Cap, first of all, and mm-hmm. B, um, what is going to go on with, um, obviously, yeah. with Chadwick Boseman's death and the character of T'Challa. So I, I do think we're going we're gonna to get some sort of hint towards uh, the fate of uh, T'Challa. In the next yeah, I, I think they'll probably leave the door open in a lot of ways because yeah. they, a lot of this was written and shot before Chadwick passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did do some reshoots that were after that, but I have to imagine this was all before. Yeah. Uh, or at least it was her role in the show was planned before. But it is interesting that Ao is kind of our globe trotting spy now, and normally she, as the Dora Milaje, has to kind of protect the, the royal, the monarch yeah. of the country. So does her, and they do, the Dora Milaje do often jump around the world, as we saw in um, in the Black Panther movie. She flanked him at the UN, yeah. but normally it's like with the monarch. Uh, they yeah. usually go out on their own. Um, but do you think this could mean like maybe if if uh, Ao is head of this royal guard, could Okoye have stepped up as a new Black Panther? That'd be an interesting. interesting. I would her. love to see Okoye as, a, as the new Black Panther. Um, I, I personally would like, I want to see, um, um, Nadia, I believe was it, uh, Black Panther's love interest. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, become Nakia. the black, next Black Panther. Um, but Akoya would be an, an excellent, um, uh, step up. Um, yeah. What I kind of want is like, uh, the Black Panther and the throne of Wakanda don't have to be the same. Uh, mm. like, it would be great if Shuri could be the ruler of Wakanda and then Akoya could be the yeah. Black Panther figure. Or that M'Baku could play one of these roles, because he's obviously a great leader and a great oh, yeah. partner. To M'Baku Wakanda. would be a great choice for Black Panther. Yeah. He's, he's he's got the charisma, he's got the he's got the guns. Um <laughs> he would be he would be fantastic. But he yes, does. I do like the idea of Shuri being a ruler, but also like a ruler slash woman in the chair for wow. Oka- Okoya, because Shuri's like super smart, obviously. So it'd be uh-huh. a, a nice little like, you know, I'm a ruler, but I'm also your your tech person and like you're the one kicking ass. So like I yeah. I do like that idea. I'm just thinking like if you're Malcolm Spellman and you want to bring in a Wakandan royal guard in this show, like mm. his end goal I think is to try to uh expose like the real history of uh the Captain America legacy. Yeah. And like in the same way that it was denied that dream was deferred for isaiah like Mm. maybe that dream was originally his birthright if you make it something that was rooted in wakanda Mm. so i'd love to see them go in that direction i don't think it would be that controversial because we already know that vibranium shield came from wakanda you know yeah i think that'd be great i i imagine if they like secretly make like you know uh, isaiah bradley have wakandan origins that'd be super dope (laughs) It's like, hey, we had a, the first black Captain America was actually Wakandan. So this yeah. is a Wakandan <laughs> legacy. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, so we'll see what comes out of that. I think it's yeah. really cool that uh, I thought just references to Wakanda and, and the White Wolf were just kind of like, we're referencing other things that happened before. But for them to actually bring in a character from that corner of the universe is really cool. I'm yes. very excited. I, um, when, it, when, uh, when Bucky started picking up those beads, I was like, no. Could no. be no, they no. wouldn't, but they did it. I was like, oh shit. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> um, so we're going to talk more about Sharon Carter, the Power Broker, Zemo, all these other questions. First, we want to thank some people who helped us make this episode. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Mm -hmm. So is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? Well, BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with them in under 48 hours. Now, this is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's just professional counseling done securely online. Uh, now, this service is available for clients worldwide. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room with, you know, as you might with traditional therapy. And BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. And it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Just visit their website and read their testimonials. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Marvel. That's Better H-E-L-P.com slash Marvel and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for Inside Marvel listeners. You can get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Marvel. Uh, we also want to thank our friends at Magic Spoon for sponsoring us. So lots of us are trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. Get yourself a variety pack of the four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. Get creative and mix the cocoa and peanut butter for a peanut butter cup vibe. Mm, so I've done it delicious. Pretty good. Go to magicspoon.com slash marvel to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code MARVEL at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason... They'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash marvel and use the code MARVEL to save $5 off. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode. All right, MT, back to our What the Falcons. I want to know from you, who the Falcon is the power broker? He comes up so much this episode. Yes. Um, so apparently, power broker is a crime lord who lives in Madripoor, this new city that we have uh, gone to in episode three of Falcon the Winter Soldier. Now, it seems like he has bad blood with Zemo, Baron yeah. Zemo, apparently, this rich Zemo. Um, and from a deleted scene in Civil War in which Zemo gassed an arms dealer at an auction. Yeah, do you think that could have been it? Right? I mean, like, there was that moment where Zemo just kind of made enemies with a lot of high-powered uh, <laughs> crime figures around the world, these international black market dealers. Like, that could have been the moment where he's like, you killed one yeah, of Yeah, I mean, like, kind of yeah. I, I mean, Zemo's just, like, a, a dick in general. So, like, I'm not surprised that he has, like, you know, bad blood with this power broker guy. But I think that that could be a, a very good hint towards, you know, potentially uh, what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But with, with deleted scenes, it's kind of hard because, like, it's a, is it canon? Is it not canon? I don't know. But Yeah, deleted scenes technically aren't really canon, but yeah. it shows intent. <laughs> yes, like. it does show that they were thinking about it at the very uh -huh. least. Uh -huh. um, but the power broker, as we see in at the end credits of Falcon and Winter Soldier, that he's always watching. So, yeah. like, does he have a surveillance or a spy network? Could Zola be behind oh! the, the John Wick bounty app? Zola. Oh, that'd be cool. Zola. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, MT, that was a whole big thing. This um, uh, Selby person got shot, and literally, yes. like, 20 seconds later word got out on this app like this is a bounty this is who they are it seemed like there was some kind of sophisticated technology yeah. behind that so either the power broker had eyes on that scene maybe through sharon carter mm. uh and then they they had that app uh ready to go and this is just something that happens in this world kind of john wick style they all, yeah. automatically all get <laughs> notified um but yeah i thought that was interesting uh for zola to be behind it oh yes, I, I hope i pray zola I hope. is the technology man and it makes sense like this power broker he's fast like he'd be texting uh -huh. carly carly mad fast and he's always uh -huh. watching so like it would make sense for zola <laughs> to be um just behind all this all this that reveal mt would be so wild it you know would like be, i will finally, jump out to... of my skin just it, celebrating it would be some wizard of oz shit they're like are you ready to meet the power broker and it's just a green face, face. on a giant screen <laughs> i would Ooh, fucking damn. love that i would love i would literally be so hyped so hyped I mean, MT and I just did a video this week. Well, I, we were both on it. MT did all the, the legwork and, like, telling us this history 
of uh, of the power broker in the comics. Go watch that video. MT does such a good job in that video. Uh, first time in the blue dungeon. It's hey. it's weirdly cold in here, right? Yes, it's cold, but yeah. I'm, I'm glad that Philip feeds us regularly. He's a very he nice does. man. Uh huh. It's it's just uh, a bag of rice, uh, not mo- <laughs> not cooked or anything. Just dry. It's just rice. the raw rice. He gives us uh-huh. one bag of rice a day. We share it. Um, and you it's... have to finish it. There's not a grain. He'll look around for the grain. Yes, he, he will grain. float around the blue void for the any grains. Uh-huh. If you leave a grain, there's no rice tomorrow. Right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but in that video, we were kind of going into some theories of who we think this power broker figure could be. Because we knew, obviously, this show is it's setting it up to be something big. MT had mm-hmm. this cool theory about how uh, White Vision from WandaVision could be connected to that. I After this episode, MT, I'm feeling pretty good about this Mandarin Ten Rings theory. Yeah. Like, yeah, like the fact the man- that he's a crime lord, they use this kind of place as like a pirate colony, pretty much. Like, mm-hmm. how many criminal warlords are there in this universe? Probably a lot, but the one that they're setting up in a title this year is going to be the Mandarin. Yeah, I, I would not be surprised if the Mandarin shows up at some point or is directly referenced in this episode. Because the Mandarin, as we saw in the uh, All Hail the King short... He's he's not messing around. He's he's right. sort of like he's sort of watching people. Like he's watching Trevor in prison, and he's got like agents all over the place. Right? Yeah. There there was like, and Feige even said this at the Comic Con panel. The dude in Iron Man Two who gives Ivan Vanko his like uh his new identity paperwork. That mm-hmm. dude was in the Ten Rings. The mm. guy in Ant Man who was uh, touring the Pym facility to try to get the Yellow Jacket tech. He had a Ten Rings tattoo mm. um, that was clear in his last angry face looking shot before he got punched and knocked out. So, like, these guys are everywhere. And, like, and what I like about the Mandarin theory is that he is, uh, Mandarin's not exactly hiding. You mm. know, he's hiding in Madripoor, but he's not uh, um, a Kaiser Soze figure that much. Yeah. Whereas if it were someone like Thaddeus Ross, Thaddeus Ross is a government official in the U.S. government. I don't think he'd be able to pull off, like, uh, a shadowy side figure whose name was the power broker who had graffiti everywhere, like, yeah. you know, declaring his existence. <laughs> like, if anything, he would not have another alias. He would, or he wouldn't be like proud about it. He'd be yeah. sneaky, sneaky. This is someone who likes to flaunt it a bit, and the Mandarin is someone who likes to flaunt. Yeah, I, I honestly, I, I sort of hope it's the Mandarin because it would be perfect setup for Shang Chi and the Mandarin. He's, he's a, he's not someone to be trifled with. He will mess you up and people are very yeah. much afraid of this man so yeah. it would it would be really cool for um like at least a player at the very least a player in this series that is teased for shang chi in the future so yeah we'll see the third what the falcon for today is what the falcon is sharon carter's real agenda eric yeah that is a good question a lot of people are saying sharon carter's the power broker no 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 i don't think sharon no. carter is the power broker just because she, the power broker sounds like someone who for decades has kind of built up this empire. Mm. Sharon, only as of 2016, did uh, start to have to resort to flee to, and I don't think she would have the time to build up. I think she is an arms dealer. I think her character's super weird now. I like seeing her fight. To that she would be this like kind of arms dealer who would weirdly laugh off stuff and then in the next second complain how she can't call her dad anymore. Like, yeah. And then uh, the weird thing is at the end of the episode, she gets in the back of this car and she goes, we've got a big problem. Actually, a couple of them. I'll tell you in the car. Let's go. And then she has a driver. Like, that was interesting. So I'm thinking her couple of problems was, one, that Dr. Nagel is dead. Um, I think she might be working for the power broker and Mm. power broker needed Nagel to. And that was new information for her, for Sharon Carter. Um, and that that he had died and then uh secondly i think the problem is is that uh people know like sharon wasn't in that lab at the time um yeah. for most of it she was doing all the legwork to you know defend it outside good lord yeah. <laughs> but i think she feels threatened now that zemo is out that um bucky and sam know this information and that this poses a problem to the power broker Yes. Um, it would be very interesting to see um, a Sharon Carter working for the power broker, potentially, because like she is kind of just asked out of luck. She just uh-huh. got kicked out of America, essentially, and she's just trying to make her ends meet. So it would make sense for her in this position to be sort of working-ish for the power broker. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I just, we just don't really know exactly yeah. what exact, what she's doing. Yeah. So, I'm very interested, but we'll see. 
Yeah, she might have been um like seduced and recruited by the Ten Rings, you mm. know. Like mm. I could see her getting approached in Majapur in a bar saying, like, hey, so your government abandoned you, right? Yeah. Thaddeus Ross uh labeled you an enemy of the state. You have to come here now. But you have uh you have some interesting skills. How would you like to work in security for us? And because she's such a badass, now she's like one of the big assassins in Majapur working underneath the power broker. And, like, she was the sniper in that window. She threw a knife in some guy's arm. She used a guy as a human shield. She's basically John Wick now. Like, yes. uh, that's interesting. I don't know if she had that. I mean, she was a badass shield agent before. But now she's, like, vicious. And that might have just been survival skills. But it's just, it's weird that Steve would have abandoned her over the course of two years. I just assumed between Winter Soldier, or between Civil War and Infinity War, that, like, even though Sharon Carter wasn't with the three of them, of tracking like Vision and Wanda through Europe, I just assumed that like she was being taken care of, you know, yeah. like she was, you know, she wouldn't have needed to become this crazy arts dealer in Madripoor. She could have like gotten by just, you know, through her old spy contacts or something. Yeah, she could have easily helped. Yes, help Steve in Infinity War. You know, just been on his team because why not? They're all on the run. Let's be on the run together. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah, why couldn't she help them? Um. She's like, let me go along. They're like, oh, there's only room for three people in this car. There's a fourth seat. But it's like, no, no, Sam likes to put his seat way back. He doesn't like to move it up. Right. <laughs> but I can crouch. Nope. Sorry. Bye. It's like, we just took out the room. Sorry. It's just... <laughs> yeah. Oh. Now, do you think, MT, that Sharon Carter was alive during the blip? Because she... Did I miss something there? Um, like, maybe that's how she spent all this time building things? But I would you know. I would assume that Sharon Carter was alive during the blip. Okay. Um, because she she does seem to have been entrenched in Mad Madripoor for a while. So yeah. it, I would guess five years um, would be enough to turn this woman into a, just a killing ruthless uh, Madripoor machine. Madripoor yeah. murder machine um, to keep the alliteration up. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think five years is enough time for her to become like a high-ranking security yeah. um, worker for the Power Brokers Network work, but not to take over like an entire criminal enterprise where people are saying Power Brokers watching. They're referring to Sharon Carter, who's walking around in the street taking her hood off. Like, doesn't add up for sure. Yeah, it it does. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that Sharon Carter's a power broker at all. Yeah. It doesn't. I'll just say if they reveal that, it's gonna be real lame, and it's gonna be another <laughs> like be great. We got another Ralph upsetting. Boner. Yeah, yeah. It would be sort of like a uh, like you know like the Mandarin thing in Iron Man three. Right, for right. Me. Just yeah. be like, come on, like you couldn't just make a new character. That would be nice. Yeah. Just a yeah. new character would be cool. All right, our next what the Falcon MT is. Uh, what do you think is next for the Super Soldier Serum? We know the Flag Smashers want to give it to these kids, um, but. Did it look like they had these close-ups of the vials in Nagel's lab? Do mm. you think anybody snatched any of those vials? I think that those vaccines, maybe, in episode two, could mm -hmm. have contained some vials, maybe? Like, yeah. that was being transported, which is oh, why the sure. power broker cares so much about, you know, his stuff being taken. Because, like, if it was vac just vaccines, I'm sure the power broker would be like, all right, they, they mess with me, but, you know, it won't be the end of the world. But... Since the power broker cares so much about this cargo, I would not be surprised if Carly uh, stole a couple of X. Uh, couple no, of for sure. Things. Yeah. Oh, no, I think that's that's totally the implication. I think the idea yeah. was those vaccines contained uh, less concentrated doses of it and they were going to disperse it to people they considered worthy of it. But I'm talking about in the lab right as it was exploding and burning mm. down. They had close up of those vials. I'm thinking, did, did uh, Zemo grab mm. one? Did Bucky or Sam grab one? That is very interesting. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't put a Pazimo to grab one for himself yeah. because, you know, he's freshly out of prison and he's like, you know what, I'm gonna I'm cause some some mayhem. But at the same time, Zemo is very against right, super soldiers did. and yeah. and superpowers. So, you know, but he 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 might have taken one, put it in his pocket. It's like I don't know what we're gonna do with this, but I'm gonna. It's better to have this than to not have this. Right. It's um, the ultimate hypocrisy. <laughs> I would say maybe he could use it as leverage or something to like. Uh force the flag smashers to heal or to you know uh get to john walker and then like tempt him with it or something like that and then yes. get uh, a permanent um you know pardon or something it's like i'll hand you over this cocktail but yeah but, at the end of the day he he does hate the whole concept of super yeah. soldiers but what i do think is going to happen and it's something that uh, i feel like this episode is teasing with john walker we see john walker really just angry in this episode and being so, like a, a mega yeah. dick 
And yeah. he, but he, I feel like a lot of that frustration comes from his lack of power because people mm. don't find him and he. I, I I feel that he feels that people don't find him intimidating because mm-hmm. he doesn't have the strength of Captain America. And so I feel like this is setting up the seeds for I need power, I need power, and then he's going to go to the power broker or mm. um you know maybe come across one of Nagel's vials and take it himself and then get juiced up um and then pretend like he wasn't juiced up. <laughs> I don't know. I yeah, I think he might already have. I think his anger in that moment was about respect. Like mm. he's mad that people don't see him as a replacement cap, mm. and he still carries the shield. He wears a similar costume. He has the same name, but people know they're they're not afraid to spit in his face because they don't respect him. But mm. like I would also say, if Steve Rogers were doing what John Walker was doing, he also would have gotten a loogie to the face. It's yeah. not that he's not Steve Rogers. It's that. He, a a police, we have this whole opening image of like the GRC, what a great thing. Smash cut to police van opens up on the shield. Like this guy, he's raiding it. He's like screaming at people. Steve Rogers didn't do that, you know? Yeah. And like, you know, obviously, you know, Captain America, with John Walker anyway, is just a a symbol. And this guy who was harboring the Flag Smashers was like, yo, F symbols. And you're a Captain Symbol. So like, you know, F you. (laughs) But yeah, no, yeah, totally. I John Walker, he, he's trying to become, he's like you said in episode two, the best Captain America that he can be. Yeah. And so with him not being respected, he's just like, nah, I'm not really Captain America, am I? Ah, this is so frustrating. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, it's I I do like what the the direction that they're taking John Walker. In. Yeah, me I too. Hope that he goes more crazy, honestly. Oh, because... me too. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Now, we talked about Zemo a little bit there. What the Falcon does Zemo know? Like, do you think he has an ulterior motive? Is he hiding something from Sam and Bucky? What do you think? Oh, yeah. The... I think that there's probably some some major Hydra secrets uh, and stuff that he knows about the Super Soldier program that he's not telling Sam and Bucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's 100% using them. And, like, when Sam and Bucky started getting shot um, and, like, running away, and, like, you know that shot that we see in the trailer – um, I I thought that Zemo just dipped. I thought he was gone, uh-huh. but he came back and uh, with the mask on, and he was just just tearing shit up. And so, yeah, what, do you, what do you think is the significance behind that mask? Like, there was a moment where he lingered on the mask on the dashboard. There was a like trunks full of other treasures in that garage. Like, there were golden guns, there were knives, there was all this other gear. Mm. It seemed to be alluding at some other super villainy past. Um, with Zemo. He kind of felt like a goofy Bond villain, didn't he, this episode? <laughs> it sort of did, and I sort of felt like this might have been, like, maybe, like, a family thing, or, like, mm. or a family tradition where, like, they were just, like, thieves or something, and, like, they wear that little ski mask and, and do crimes, uh-huh. or it wore, it's just something that he used to wear back in his, um, back in the day when he was in, um, just, I don't know, just doing evil stuff, or, like, being in, like, a, a or I don't know. I, I I do feel like it's something connected to his past, and he's 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 worn it a lot, and something that he usually takes into uh, altercations like that. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because the characterization, the backstory we got of him in Civil War is that he was just this uh, Sokovian militant. He kind of mm. led a death squad uh, during these past conflicts of Sokovia, but now he describes himself as a royal. Uh, mm. and he's like a royal without a country anymore mm. uh, which just feels like a comp it feels like you know they'll have like Prince William or Prince Harry do a little bit they'll do a tour of service in, in the British Armed Forces uh, it Just it's kind of like a, this is just a rite of passage they have to learn the, the, the steps of what their military <laughs> units do yeah. um, but like that uh, now it just doesn't sit well with me. It felt like there was a version of Zemo in Civil War that worked and it was fine. And now the mm. show is like, no, we're going to make him more like his comic book version. But uh, I didn't need Zemo to be rich. I don't know. Yeah, I, I do like the the one, the Zemo that we, we were sort of getting teased of in, in Civil War. Like with the like, just the, I have a family and I was just a, a victim of, of terrible circumstances. Yeah. But like now that Zemo's rich, I'm just like, well, now I kind of care about your past a little bit less because you were pretty well to do. Um, yeah. But at the same Didn't time, yeah. you know, it does suck to lose a family. So, right. I it just felt like they made him rich so that they could have a private jet that Sam and Bucky could travel around the world without having to go through customs and stuff. like yeah. that. Yeah, 
it, um, it did seem a little bit like a, a plot moving forward element that they were just like, all right, we just, he's rich and he has a plane, so we're going to Madripoor now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there was like some kind of raw rage with him in Civil War that I feel like is lost. Now, don't get me wrong. I love what Daniel Brühl is doing with this. He was a delight yes. to watch this episode. He was fantastic. Every time the camera cut to him, I was like, ooh, he's making a fun choice right <laughs> it's now. It's Daniel Brühl, my favorite. It's just the plotting with the character. It's like if you're bringing Zemo back, it seems like the writers of the show don't really know exactly what to do with Zemo and didn't really understand what Zemo was in Civil War. Um mm. Not to say they have to. I mean, in Thor Ragnarok, Taika Waititi completely took over that world and made it his own. And it was great. But really, the world, the tone changed, but the character stayed true. Thor was just as bit as self-obsessed and uh, took himself way too seriously, as was Loki. Loki was still a huge ego. Uh, Hulk was really maybe the only one who changed because he actually had a personality now. Uh, mm. But it was justified by the nature of that world. Uh, so really it was just a world around him that felt goofy and changed, so we went along with it. It's different when you take a character and fundamentally things that were important to them before are no longer important. Bucky, for example. Mm. Like, he would not care that much about hunting down the super soldier serum so much that he would go confront this guy who ruined his life, mm. uh, even further in Civil War, and was in prison, and then break him out of prison in this kind of rushed uh last minute prison break that felt like a, a lame uh oceans 11 <laughs> thing. it would have been a lot cooler if we saw like the planning and and just like if that would have been a much more thought out sequence right than... anything like i mean it doesn't have to be uh shawshank redemption or silence of the lambs like two of the best cinematic prison escapes that really <laughs> kept you guessing exactly how this is gonna go out yeah. um but like Really, you're just going through the classic, oh, there's a prison riot, and I'm going to put on a prison guard uniform, steal his badge, and get out, and just, like, avoid cameras. It felt like a joke, and it, it felt like kind of disservice to the badass version of Zemo that we were presented in Civil War. Um, yeah, and, like, you know, Zemo is this super smart guy. So if, if it was as simple as, all right, create a distraction so I can get out, I feel like you would have done that a long time ago, because it seems yeah. like a very... It seemed very easy for Zemo to just escape. He just like, all right, put on a costume, and then now I'm out. It right. was super quick. So super quick. Hey, look, this is a TV show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we still enjoy most of yes. what's going on here. I don't want to gripe too much. But in terms of what Zemo's next step is, he seems to be a guy without a country. Obviously, he's going to betray Sam and Bucky at some point. I just want to know what it's going to be over. Um, uh, MT, before we uh, started rolling, you mentioned this idea that Zemo, would he go kill Isaiah Bradley as another super yes, soldier? Yes, because Zemo was not about super soldiers at all. And with Isaiah's blood being a factor in the creation of more super soldiers, I feel like Zemo's just probably like, you know what? Let's just uh, get that out of the picture. Like, because this this is a factor that's still here. He's alive. He's a, It's a 90-year-old factor. Let's just get rid of it. I mean, this, yeah. why not? I mean, just so so we just don't have any more super soldiers, so we can stop the power broker from from we get rid of all of his vials, and then we get rid of Isaiah, and now there's no more problem. Well, depending on where Steve is, we don't really know what yeah. happened to Steve, but it's really sounding like in the, the in this episode that they keep using past tense mm -hmm. with with Steve, and I'm just like, is he really gone? I hope not. But yeah, see, we'll, we'll I think see. I think Zemo is gonna kill John Walker. I, I I think John Walker might go early. Um, Interesting. Really? Because Sam and Bucky get that shield back. We've seen that in all the promo footage. And it's like, mm. would he part with that shield? I don't think that shield's a prop shield. I don't think there's multiple shields. I think there's just that one shield. And I think some mission where they all end up in a snowy field together, uh, based off of set photos where, you know, the four of them are together and it's mm. snowy. And based off of, like, you know how uh if zemo like that would be his ultimate revenge he actually gets to kill the new captain america uh i think that would be wild and i think that would give us uh a full arc for john walker as someone who started sympathetic it would make us feel a bit bad for john walker as just another government instrument who ends mm. in the, you know doesn't really get his own life at the end of the day and uh and that would make zemo part from these two and they would get the shield back you know or they could get the shield back because somehow they're going to have to get it back. And I just don't know how John Walker's going to part ways with it. Otherwise. Yeah, I, I mean, man, that's a very interesting. If Zemo does kill John Walker, I will scream audibly. I will be like, oh, Eric was right. 
Um. <laughs> and just do that uh, if I'm wrong or when I'm wrong. Just say, oh, Eric was wrong. <laughs> Was right still um but no it was it, that would be crazy if zemo kills walker because they're setting up walker walker's character to be like this really like torn and in, in, in this person struggling to fill in uh cap shoes so for him for them just to be like all right you struggled and you failed and now you're dead that'd be some baller shit i would yeah. love that i would it would be it would be crazy it would be cr- some some like game of thrones ish type stuff yeah. well good era games of thrones uh, well we I'm do it Three more episodes of this uh, series left, so time is running out, but yes. I'm so excited to see what they do next. We're going to leave it there for this episode of Inside Marvel, our after show for the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I want to thank MT for diving into this episode with me. Hey, thank you for, you know, being with me as well, because oh, you a, are amazing to talk It's a to. gift. It is a gift. Uh, MT and I are going to be back next Friday for our reaction to episode four and our after show. We're going to answer all the questions you've had about it. And make sure to follow MT at Mastertainment. Follow me at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstar. Subscribe to Inside Marvel wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for watching. Uh, we're going to jump now to our stereo listeners because we have the all simulcast right. in stereo. We're going to take your questions. So stereo. get ready. Stick around. Um, but for now, we're going to close out with our favorite moment of the episode, which has got to be... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.